Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we're taking a look at the router plane and why this is one of the most beloved tools in a wood shop. Router planes come in many different shapes and sizes and styles, but they all do basically the same thing. They create a flat surface coplanar to another flat surface, just at two different heights. With the router plane, I can reference off of this face and this face, and I can come in here and remove the material in between. After doing so, I know that this space is perfectly coplanar with the space on the other side because I'm referencing these sides down to this one. Commonly, we think about using a router plane to do dados, grooves, rabbits, and tenons, but it can do a lot of other things. I can just reference on the one side over here. All my pressure is pushing down here, and I'm rotating this one. Then I can slowly go down a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper until I get it down to exactly where I want it to be. When adjusting the depth, keep this tight. Don't let the iron move. We're gonna come up here to the adjuster nut and now we're going to rotate this down a little ways. We can then loosen it. The iron drops down a little bit, tighten it back up. And now the iron has moved down by the slop of this nut, which is about a quarter turn. That's why there is a little bit of slop in this so you get a quarter turn of movement every time you need it. That gives you just about the right amount of cut to the next level down. So to illustrate, right now we're not cutting. I'm not going to loosen this up yet. I'm just going to move this nut down that quarter turn. Now we can loosen it, let the iron drop down, tighten it back up, and now I'm cutting just about a hundredth of an inch lower. That's exactly what we want. When cutting off a tenon, you don't want to blow all the way out the other side because then you'll end up chipping off these opposite corners. Instead, you want to work from one side towards the middle and then turn the plane around and work at it from the other side. This way you're always pushing the fibers into the middle and you'll get a nice clean entrance and exit wound on both sides. Sometimes this base just isn't big enough and it doesn't give you a good reference surface out here. So what you can do is use these screws to actually attach a bigger piece of wood on here and give yourself a larger base. I actually went and made a one-sided router so now I have this big reference surface and I can come over here and route out the end really easily. I have a whole bunch of videos on making router planes, but I really like this design. It has the simple depth adjuster just like the others, but then these nuts in the back hold it back in. Some of the other things you can do with this is you can loosen it up, slide this up, take your nut cutter off, then you can actually rotate this around, and you can put your cutter on the back side. That way, if you have a wall you're working up against, you're not gonna be getting in the way with the handle and you can get right up to the surface. Some router planes even have locations that you can mount them out on the ends of the handles so you can have more surface area if you're working on tenons. One of the problems with router planes is you can only go down as deep as your adjusting nut can go. But with even with this one, we can loosen it up. We can then take the iron off of the depth adjuster and lock the iron down here and I can go a little bit farther. Moving the iron and locking it down here gives me almost three quarter inch deeper cut that I can make with my router plane. The most common cutter you're going to find in a router plane is a half inch wide cutter, though you will sometimes find quarter inch or I have seen eighth inch cutters as well. And then you will see this double bevel cutter. I really like the double bevel. Anytime I'm going against the grain, this tends to shear it a little bit more so you're not going to be getting quite as much tear out. And the nice thing with the old Stanley cutters is they have the exact same shape from Veritas. So if you need one for your old Stanley, you can go to Veritas. Or if you have old Stanley cutters, you can put them in your Veritas plane. One of the nice things with the Stanley 71 is it has this big open mouth. That makes it far easier to see the work you're actually doing in front of you. The problem is you don't have any surface area you heard reference with. So it comes with this little foot you can put in here that will close that up so you still have reference surface there in the middle. Also on that piece, this foot can come off, and this can be used as a depth of cut. It kind of acts as a sole in front of the iron, so theoretically you're not gonna cut too deep. And so you can do pass by pass, and each pass go a little bit deeper until you're down to depth. So you can kind of use it like a grooving plane. In all honesty, it doesn't work that well, but every now and then it might be useful. You can also get this fence that will mount into these grooves and create a fence to put your cutter a certain distance away from the edge. This allows you to come in, put the fence against the wood, and know that your groove that you're making is going to be in a specific distance in. You can also flip the fence around and use the two rounded points if you're going around a rounded corner, though I've never used that. In all honesty, the fence here is a, such a small bearing surface, I've had problems with it. Usually I prefer to clamp something larger on here than this small fence. If, it, if you are... Yeah. 
if you are using the router at the end of a board and you're trying to work on a long tenon, sometimes you'll find that it's tipping over causing you to cut deeper. The easiest answer for that is grab some other board that's the same thickness, put it over here, and now you have something to reference both sides and get a nice even cut. Now the most common question is how do you go about sharpening that thing? It's just a weird shape. Now it's true, many of the new ones actually have a foot that can come off. There's a screw on the end, you can loosen it and take this off. And that does make it a lot easier. But then you're trying to sharpen this tiny little piece. Usually at that point, I'm gonna use some vice grips as a sharpening guide and do it much like I would a spokeshave iron. But for the standard ones, I'm gonna do it the exact same. I'm gonna put it flat down here. All my pressure is going to be here on the nose. I can slide that on the plate and polish the bottom, or in this case, the back of the iron. But to do the bevel, I'm gonna to have to move the plate over to the side of something so that it can overhang. I'm gonna put my finger tight on the tip and we sharpen on that. It's no different than a chisel or an iron. You're just doing two faces that meet in a sharp point. And one of the nice things about them is that they don't tend to go dull very quickly. You don't use them all the time and they're usually a fairly light duty cut. So I only sharpen mine once every six months, maybe a year, and uh, you don't have to spend that much time worrying about them. One of the problems with router planes is they've gotten really expensive, especially the antiques. Most of them are the same price as buying one brand new from Veritas. And really, uh, yeah, that's, that's pricey. But the nice thing about a router plane is you can make it yourself. You can do something as simple as a poor man's router like Paul Sellers shows, just jamming a chisel into a piece of wood, or you can make something really fancy. And there are lots of plans and designs out there for making routers. I probably have five or six different videos on making five or six different types of routers. They're very easy to make, and you can have one that will do just as good as this. And if something goes wrong with it, you can make another one. They don't take that long. The router plane is one of those fun the router plane is one of those fun hand tools that even a full power tool user is probably going to be reaching for from time to time because it's great for doing that final finish that clean up and making things just fit, fit perfectly. It is a really cool tool that can provide a lot of accuracy to your woodworking. So there's some of my favorite router plane tips, tricks, secrets, whatever you want to call them. I would love to hear yours. Are there other things that I didn't mention on this that you commonly do or tips and tricks that you come up with? Let me know those down below. Thank you. I do love reading through those. I learn a lot. As well as that, anytime you put comments down below, it does help out the channel. Even if it's just simply comment down below, thank you. Uh, there's a lot of people who do that, and that means a lot because it helps us get in front of more people, helps the algorithm. That's YouTube. You know how it works. Hit the like, comment, share, subscribe, and thank you. I think that'll do it for now. <laughs> so, yes, on top of that, there are a bunch of names over here, and I do want to say a huge thank you to all of these people. Those are all patrons on Patreon. Between patrons on the channel or members down below, people have clicked the thank you button. Button. Uh, honestly, huge, huge thank you. Without you guys, we wouldn't be here. We are completely sponsored by you. So if you'd like to find out more about that, you can go down below. We do offer, offer special perks for both patrons and members, and thank you. I think that'll do it for now, and until next time, have a wonderful day. I used to think that these were made by the military, and then I realized they weren't. But militaries should have a lot more of these, because every military man knows that it's a great thing when you can rout your enemy.